Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight Latino Voices. I'm Phil Ponce and thank you for sharing part of your weekend with us. On the show tonight, a surge in respiratory virus is putting healthcare institutions on high alert. We break down what's behind the rise and how you can protect yourself. Allegations of wage theft from workers at a Southside pizza restaurant. As the Latino population grows, can the number of Latino elected officials grow with it? The more that we understand other cultures, the less fear that there is. And an Orland Park Ballet Company has an important lesson on addressing mental health as told through dance. All that coming up at our first story tonight. Respiratory infections are on the rise and what you need to know right after this. Chicago Tonight Latino Voices is made possible in part by the support of these donors. Though this weekend's balmy weather might indicate otherwise, winter is on the way. And unfortunately, one's lungs will have a lot to look out for this season, so to speak. Respiratory infections are on the rise. High rates of flu and COVID infections are expected. And a nationwide shortage of pediatric hospital beds and ICU resources is straining the health care system once again. Joining us now with more are Dr. Juanita Mora, an allergist and immunologist at the Chicago Allergy Center. Dr. Geraldine Luna, medical director at the Chicago Department of Public Health. Uh, doctors, thank you both for joining us. And first of all, Dr. Luna, if I can begin with you, there's something afoot called RSV. What is RSV? Hi, yes, thank you for having me. RSV is respiratory syncytial virus and is a it's a virus, unfortunately, that has a preference for children, and we see it in the season. We started to see, in the, in the case of here in Illinois and Chicago, a race in summer. And it's unfortunate because it does send children to the hospital. It requires an a, a intensive care unit, and those patients are complicated and, you know, present the severe face of the disease, and it could be responsible for the deaths of individuals. And what are the symptoms of RSV? RSV is like, it presents like every cold syndrome uh, that we see. It's cough, runny nose. Then a, it's a, that respiratory distress that we start seeing in severe case, a presentation of the disease. So then is when um, our families, you know, and caregivers have the necessity to look for that health care, going to the emergency department. And uh, and it's a, and then we, uh, after it's been diagnosed, it, Unfortunately, there's not much treatment, so it's symptomatic treatment. And an occasion requires ventilation or mechanical ventilation at the intensive care unit. Uh, Dr. Mora, this, this, this sounds kind of alarming. Uh, at what point does a family realize that uh, maybe they should take their child to the hospital? The very important um, signs to look out for. One is if the child starts having trouble breathing. So they're using their accessory muscles, which means their chest is moving up and down or the cough gets worse. That's a sign that they're having trouble breathing. The other sign, signs of dehydration. So they're not eating as much. They're not drinking enough fluids. For babies, they're not putting out as many diapers. These are signs that these children should go to the emergency department. And Dr. Morris, staying with you, uh, what, is the, uh, what is the demand right now? How are pediatric units uh, dealing with, uh, with RSV? Well, there's definitely a high demand all throughout the country. Um, RSV is a disease that causes 2.1 million hospital visits and 150,000 hospitalizations a year for RSV. Right now we're seeing an early surge of RSV, which is causing a lot of pediatric intensive care units to be full. So we wanna make sure to teach parents what signs, when to take them to the ER, so that the child with the broken leg from soccer or the child with asthma has a bed in the emergency department if needed. Well, let's talk about uh, let's talk about the uh, the flu vaccine. The uh, flu apps, uh, flu vaccine uptake is lower among Black and Latino population than than others. Dr. Luna, what's behind this discrepancy? Unfortunately, uh, there is many factors. It's just not one thing that we can address. 
A lot of our communities, especially rural areas, don't have the same access to care. Uh, so there's those structural barriers. Unfortunately, there is a mistrust and lack of confidence in our vaccines. And then the health insurance is another problem, adding to those structural nationwide. So that's why we're seeing this lag of individuals getting their vaccines, families taking that proactive approach to getting vaccine. And that's exactly what we need to address. Dr. Murr, we've heard of uh, different communities being perhaps uh, more um, more skeptical of vaccines than others. Uh, at, at this point, with all the public education that's gone on, how does one convince somebody who has been reluctant, who has developed this uh, uh, antipathy towards uh, vaccines to actually get vaccinated? Well, I think it's breaking down barriers a uh, person at a time. So it's as physicians, as nurses, even medical assistants, everyone has their part, pharmacists at the, phar at the pharmacy as well too. We all can take part in having that conversation, starting to ensue trust in people who still have mistrust, telling them, look at all the people that are, that are no longer here with us because they were not vaccinated. COVID-19 has taken enough lives within you know all our country and it's been very hard hit in the latino and african-american communities that's always my conversation with them and i tell them and this is why we need to vaccinate so that way we can save more lives and continue saving more lives winter is about to start time to get your covid 19 vaccine or booster and your flu shot too uh dr luna my understanding is that uh that the uh, the, mo the the rates of of people getting the most recent COVID vaccine, uh, the rates are low. Uh, again, can you amplify on why that might be? Yeah, this is unfortunate, um, especially with our Latinx community that we know that our children, population of children is the largest community of children in Illinois, in Chicago. So we have a 38% of eligible Children in the Latinx community, we have less than 6% that have taken a booster. And in, in, in when we're talking about the bivalent booster, and the important that I, I have to stress it out to families is that it has all the updated information for the current of a variance. It's a variance that we have out there. It's incredible how we look at the previous version and the one that we have. And we know that we have lost protection using the previous monovalent vaccine that we had around it has been 1,750 mutations since the Wuhan the COVID-19 first appeared as, a, as, a, as, as the initial of the pandemic. So now we're talking about a lot of stretch in terms of the differences of that viruses versus the ones that we have, which are still COVID-19, but very well mutated. So getting that actual booster will make a whole difference. And uh, we're seeing that it's a lot of misinformation out there. This is another thing that we have identified. There's doctors saying the massive heart attacks happening in children when it's not true. We really encourage our parents to get the information from authorized sources and get the right information, sit down in a language and a culture that we understand and make sense of that so we can make informed decisions. The protection with this vaccine is incredible. We have had more than 600 billion individuals globally been vaccinated with an incredible success and efficiency and safety. Overall safety has always guided our decisions here in the United States. And these vaccines are safe and they do prevent now infections, reinfections, hospitalizations and death. And uh, we thank you both for your insights. Uh, we appreciate it, Dr. Juanita Mora and Dr. Geraldine Luna. Our thanks. Always a thank pleasure. Thank you for having us. Local restaurant Nady's Pizza is facing allegations of wage theft by current and former workers. A group of workers gathered at the restaurant's 26th Street location this week alongside workers' rights organization Arise Chicago. Jose Oribe of that group and worker Asayel Espinosa outline some of their grievances. We're here today uh, because uh, workers at Nati's Pizza approached us uh, earlier this year in February, uh, alleging many violations they endured in their workplaces, among them um, wage concerns and misclassification as employees. Uh, they've been uh, referred to as independent contractors here, which is one of the things we're disputing. Uh, there were charges uh, submitted in state court against the employer. 
Um, the next thing that's coming up will be in December. There'll be a status conference. En las 14 horas que estamos trabajando, porque son 14 horas, no recibimos ninguna compensación más que solamente el, el costo del delivery que hacemos. Es por eso que estamos el día de hoy aquí para exigir nuestros, nuestros derechos y que, se nos, y que se nos pague conforme paga la ley. We reached out to Nadie's Pizza for comment, but did not hear back. And up next, as the Latino population grows, a push for political representation to reflect that growth. So stay with us. Latinos continue to be one of the fastest growing groups in the country. In Illinois, they make up 18% of the population. In Chicago, more than 28%. But when it comes to representation in politics, less than 2% of Latinos are in elected positions nationwide. Many Latino leaders have been calling for more political representation, and today we discuss specifically why. Joining us now with more are Juan Carlos Linares. He's a member of the Illinois Latino Agenda. Gilbert Villegas, alderman of the 36th Ward and chair of the C Chicago City Council's Latino Caucus. And Marta Soto, she's a member of the Puerto Rican Bar Association of Illinois. And welcome all to Chicago tonight. Uh, Alderman Villegas, looking at the big picture, how would you assess the state of Latino political power in the city and in the state? Yeah, I would say that in the city, um, what you saw with the redistricting is that we're trying to put ourselves in a position uh, to try to achieve some type of parity. Uh, we picked up two additional seats uh, where we were looking for three. Uh, but towards the end, when the redistricting finally uh, came to a conclusion, what we saw was ideology really defeat community. Uh, and what I say by that is that we had some folks that uh, represent the Latino community that actually caved in because of ideology. Uh, and really what that gave me the sense of was, is that as a community, we're still young as it relates to politics. We're not there yet about trying to get that power, but we're going to get there. Uh, so the fact that we picked up two additional seats is something that I'm, I'm happy with. And yet you voted against the plan. Now, I rem remind us why. Yeah, I voted against the plan because of the fact that when we looked at the demographics and we looked at the population, uh, when we're talking about Voting Rights Act, we want to make sure that uh, we're looking at protected classes. And what we saw for the first time in Chicago was two minority groups that make up a third of the city in a position where had we worked together, we would have really, both communities would have won. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, our community came up one seat short. We're going we're gonna to get that again at the, at the next redistricting. Um, but again, I think we weren't ready yet, um, but we're going to continue to advocate for that. Uh, Juan Carlos Lunanis, is it always the case that, uh, or it seems to be the case that, uh, at least the perception is, that when one group, quote, wins, another group, quote, loses. Yeah. Uh, how do you see it? Yeah, well, we're all in this together, Phil. So first of all, the Illinois Latino Agenda itself came together during the height of the pandemic. We're 22 of the largest Latino serving nonprofits in the region. Um, and we knew that our communities had issues like access to digital resources. So you know that when folks didn't have devices or connection to internet, they were last in line to get their COVID vaccines when they first came out. But you know what? The same circumstances happen in African-American communities. So when we advocate for greater representation, which of course we need, and as the saying goes, you can't be what you can't see. So for our young people to have that vision, right? They have to see us in office. Um, but the other side is also the same. This is a yes and proposition. So even if we're not represented by Latinos, we want to make sure that our elected representatives are, are culturally competent in how they serve us. Language access is important. And so to conclude this question, uh, we have a program called Vota Ya, where mobilization and education of voters is also key. So yes, the top down, we need to see ourselves represented, but the bottom up, we need to mobilize folks who are, register who are eligible to vote to register and to do so as well. And Marta Soto, what do you see as some of the impediments to increase political influence? Well, um, so we need more representation on the judiciary, not just in Cook County, but in the Illinois Appellate Court and in the Illinois Supreme Court. Um, Having more diversity on the bench, it just creates more trust in the system, more uh, more equality. Um, how can we have faith in the system if we're not fully represented and if we don't have any power in that system? So we need more um, appointments to the appellate court uh, from a Latino or Hispanic descent and to the Illinois Supreme Court as well. Uh, speaking of the Illinois Supreme Court, there was recently a vacancy. It was filled. It was not filled by uh, a Latino. Your reaction to that? Well, uh, Phil, 
I think um, in the last census, we learned that, um, as you stated earlier, we're now the biggest uh, minor, the biggest ethnic population, second biggest ethnic population in um, Cook County, and we have uh, about 30% in Chicago. And we think that this was a missed opportunity for the Illinois Supreme Court to appoint a Latino or Hispanic uh, appellate court, uh, any judge to the Supreme Court, uh, to be represented, representative of the population now that we are. Uh, uh, Gilbert Villegas, let's talk about something that happened, uh, not in the state, but uh, uh, obviously you know about the story out of L.A. where some Latino city council members were heard making disparaging remarks about other groups. What, what, what was your reaction to yeah. that as a member of the city council here? No, absolutely. I, I, I thought those, I thought those uh, comments were disgusting uh, because the reality is, is that, uh, as Juan mentioned earlier, it's not an either or. Um, we're, we're, we're a third of the city. African Americans make up almost a third of the city as well. So together, we make up 66%, approximately 66% of the population. If we work together to address some of these issues uh, that, are that are impacting our communities, um, I think that both communities can win. And so when we heard that it was, it was a, short, a short win or, or, or vision um, that, quite frankly, was marginalizing another community that's been disinvested in, uh, and are facing sim similar, changes, uh, similar challenges that we are, I thought that was a missed opportunity. And so those, those comments were disgusting. Uh, the uh, former uh, council president stepped down, not just from her president as of the council, but also from the, from the city uh, council. Uh, and you heard it all the way from President Biden mm -hmm. on down uh, to, the, to the fact that, um, that this is how serious and egregious it was that she needed to step down. Uh, not, not just to... Not just to um, uh, not just to to bring back justice, but it was it was just because of the fact that it was just those comments were just disgusting. Let me add to that, if I can, sure. uh, Phil. In that, uh, this is also an opportunity. It's an opportunity for us to say, particularly from the Illinois Latino agenda, uh, emphatically that Black Lives Matter. Right? And it's emphatically uh, true that the lives of our indigenous Latinos and indigenous Native Americans, that their lives have value and they're the original fabric of our nation as well. So this all goes to say that uh, in my work day to day with the Association House of Chicago, I'm the president and CEO there, we serve the gamut. So yes, we are a proud Latino serving institution, but 30% of whom we serve is African American. We're all in this together. So what's good for the Latino community in Illinois is good for all Illinoisans. In, in one case in point, uh, the Illinois Latino Agenda put together a public safety summit not too long ago. Well attended, it was a diverse attendance there. And one of the outcomes that we put forward is that we're calling on our city and our state legislators, including the aldermen here, of course, to help us with greater funding for mental health resources to address the root causes of crime, not just for the victims uh, to move forward in their lives, but to help people to not become perpetrators in the first place. This not only is a positive if we are able to get that funding for the Latino community, but also for African Americans who live in proximity to poverty, to pain, and injustice as well. Martha Sosa, you talked uh, earlier about the importance of having Latino representation on the bench. How do you get that? Uh, well, I think, you know, the judiciary needs to, you know, count us more when taking into consideration vacancies that need to be filled. Um, but we also need to also get out and vote for these uh, candidates and do your research and vote for candidates um, that can create more diversity in the judiciary. Last question for you, Alderman, and that is uh, the prospect of a Latino mayor. What are your thoughts on that? Well, let me just piggyback for one second. Um, it, the, the Democratic committee men um, are, are the ones who help get like, judges elected, and we got to do a better job of making sure that we're educating some mm -hmm. of our other committee men that, the, that there needs to be diversity on the bench, and that's something that we're, that we're uh, committed to. Uh, uh, on the issue of a uh, potential Latino mayor at some point? Yeah, I would say that it's going to be sooner than later. Um, I think that um, uh, there's a couple of people, people still um, have, all, not, all, not everybody has declared for mayor yet, so we'll see. But you, uh, you expect it sooner than, rather than later, you think? Yes. Okay, we'll, we'll keep watching. Juan Carlos Linares, Alderman Gilbert Villegas, and Marta Soto, thank you all for joining us. We very much appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Phil. And up next, addressing mental health through dance. So stay with us. Hispanic Heritage Month has come to a close, but one ballet company southwest of the city 
is still celebrating its heritage while also bringing attention to mental health. Arts correspondent Angel Ido introdu introduces us to Ballet 58. For the last 11 years, professional dancers with Ballet 58 in Orland Park have utilized the practice to not only express their passion, but to tell stories to a community lacking substantial art resources. The foot is just kind of beveled. Yeah, beautiful. Artistic but director Juliana Rubio Slaker believes that commitment is important. Out here in the suburbs, there just tends to be a lack of awareness and understanding about how important the arts are. So what I love is that we have the chance to educate and to really bring that important cornerstone of the community to a place where nobody else is kind of in that space. They're currently using their work to educate their peers on a difference of identities with a Hispanic Heritage Month showcase. One is called Mi Familia. I wanted to create something that would show people the real heart of Mexican immigrants. Um, and the music is incredible. It's by Arturo Morquez. And it's this beautiful piece of music that kind of captures the highs and the lows of family life. And so the ballet is all about the joy of family. It's all about supporting one another and loving one another and living in community. So my hope is that it helps people to kind of walk a mile in somebody else's shoes. Miranda Rubio has been dancing professionally with the company for the past three years. Being of Hispanic heritage and white passing, Rubio says she's utilized her positionality to ensure that her primarily white colleagues feel comfortable dancing outside of their comfort zones. When we were staging Mi Familia initially, when I would use a Spanish term to refer to a flamenco step, they would then kind of re-say it, but in English or in another dance terminology that's similar. So we actually had a rehearsal and Miss Juliana set aside time at the beginning of that for me to be able to speak to the whole company and teach them, okay, here's how you say golpe, here's what a planta is, here's a tocón, and like kind of speak through what flamenco is, give them a little introduction to it. You know, ballet is all in French. Very few of us are actually French. We talk in French all the time. It's perfectly okay to do a dance style that is not from your country of origin and to respectfully use the terms that are used within that style of dance. Among these conversations of cultural awareness will also come stories addressing mental health issues. Dia de los Vivos. So it's a play on Dia de los Muertos, but Dia de los Vivos means day of the living. And so this ballet actually is from my own journey with clinical depression. Um, that's something that I've struggled with on and off for about 10 years. What you'll see in the piece is that my family is kind of there, the people who have passed on, and they're encouraging me to choose life and to keep going. Um, and they're reminding me of the beauty of life and that though it does get difficult, my job is to carry on because of all the people who have come before me. So that's so important for artistic directors is to be honest about where they've been in that journey so that their dancers and then their students see that and go, oh, if I'm struggling, I can get help. Like, I want to see people decrease that stigma and really understand how vital it is that we take care of our mental health and that we strip back, um, I think, some of the expectation that artists are just perfect all the time. Whether it be educating non-diverse communities, mental health, or just telling a story on the importance of family, Ballet 58 hopes audiences leave with a sense of understanding. Looking past our differences and looking to what makes us the same brings us together far quicker than anything else will. For Chicago Tonight Latino Voices, I'm Angel Ito. And you can see more from the Ballet 58 Company in their Day of the Dead celebration. That's happening on October 31st. 90 floors up in the air at the 360 Chicago Observation Deck inside the John Hancock Building. Dates uh, for the company's other fall performances are on our website, although I don't think they call it the John Hancock Building anymore. And that is our show for this weekend. Be sure to check out our website, wttw.com slash news, for the very latest from WTTW News. While you're there, visit our comprehensive voter guide for the upcoming general election. It features a rundown of local races, candidates, bios and statements and if you're watching us on saturday night know that you can also catch latino voices and black voices on sundays beginning at 10 p.m now for all of us here at chicago tonight latino voices i'm phil ponce thank you for sharing part of your weekend with us stay healthy stay safe and good night
Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm that is proud of its partners named Illinois Leading Lawyers by the Law Bulletin Publishing Company of Chicago.